Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Welcome. This afternoon, this is our 10th class meeting. That means we're getting significantly through the class. It's two thirds of the way through the class. And so I'd like to try to meet with people uh, individually to catch check up on your progress, if there are any things you need help with, uh, especially working with you on your class projects. So please uh, contact me this week uh, to try to set up a meeting, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings to uh, discuss projects. And again, anything, you're always welcome. I know I was hard to reach last week, and so I appreciate people's patience with that. Uh, I'm more available now this week. It was my first travel since the lockdown. Things were a bit chaotic. So this is lecture 10 of E340-542. Uh, we're going to be talking about the in-host models of infection today that we started on two weeks ago. I'm also going to be asking you to do the presentations that we had started two weeks ago that were delayed. Um, I'd appreciate uh, your engagement with this. I need to remind you that the class is as always live streamed and recorded. So please keep that in mind. So why don't we begin by just as an outline for the class, uh, I'm gonna go over the time scales calculations we did for influenza uh, two weeks ago, because I think we went through that a little bit fast. And then we will do the uh, in-host uh, viral replication models uh, uh, again, because we really rushed that uh, last time. So there were two things that I had asked you to prepare to present. Uh, one of them was your reviews of the uh, prior uh, projects uh, to get a sense of what worked and what didn't work. And I'm gonna turn the class over to people who didn't do the presentations yet on that uh, to do that. And then last week, I know you were doing uh, with uh, TJ and Giuliano, you were doing the uh, in-class uh, replication project as a way of learning a little bit about how to think about that kind of project. I hope those are, those are useful exercises for you for the, uh, as you prepare your class project. And so I'd like people to present their results from last week today. So let's start out with the student uh, reviews of the old NanoHub application. So uh, you'll remember that a couple, three weeks ago, I had asked you to each uh, look at one of the uh, existing NanoHub applications um, and then to uh, do a written uh, critique of it and then also to demo that application to, the student, to your classmates and also do a critique, a presentation of, of a few PowerPoint slides on your experience with it and how it could be better. Uh, and we had one person uh, very valiantly volunteer, but we still are uh, five people short in terms of going through the class. And so I'd like to go through those today. Uh, who would like to go first in terms of a presentation today? Uh, my windows are all a mess, but I can go. I'm sorry? I'm uh, uh, sort of uh, struggling to get all of my all of my windows in line because there's the the document and then the uh, Nano Hub application and then the PowerPoint. So I'm you know moving stuff around all over right. the place, but uh, I can go. Okay, sure. Um, it's uh, and the one thing you need to try to that's helpful sometimes if you're doing the PowerPoint is if you go into the PowerPoint settings where you do the configuration of the slideshow, uh, the default is it takes the whole window, but you can tell it to, to, to do, a, to do uh, I mean, the whole, the whole desktop, but you can tell it to just do a sub, sub window. Uh, that, that usually makes it easier to do uh, split screen. But go ahead. I mean, this is part of, uh, this is part of the, 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 the experience of trying to do it. So, uh, as you've seen, I mean, certainly uh, Giuliano and I do it all the time and occasionally occasionally we have problems as well. So please, please go ahead. Let's see what you've got. Okay. 
Yeah, so um, this is the uh, this is the application. Uh, uh, it's based on uh, the this paper by uh, Bachman et al. Um, uh, it is a uh, an exploration of uh, the ways that uh, the uh, the viral kinetics of uh, a of um, influenza A, uh, uh, sort of how that acts within the uh, within the host. So uh, it starts from a uh, a relatively simple model, uh, just going from uh, uh, from target to infected uh, to virus. Uh, or uh, viral load, uh, you can see results of the model and uh, there are uh, ways you can change them. And I believe it asks you to uh, adjust in certain ways. Uh, and then there is a, uh, 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 more adjustments and uh, parameter fitting. Uh, then there is a model with a delay between uh, the uh, cell that is infected and the cell that is infected and producing virus. Then uh, same thing, uh, different sliders, uh, parameter fitting. Uh, uh, then there is a model that includes immune response uh, with a uh, a new variable for that. And yes, uh, I believe there was another model. I might have skipped over it, but uh, I have all that information up in the slideshow. So I'll just go to that. Um, so uh, that was just to show the show what it looks like and then uh, the slideshow itself. Uh, so the project covers uh, various models of infection of influenza A under various circumstances or accounted for various factors. Um, uh, mathematically, uh, the, the model seems accurate. My only really uh, criticism is that it assumes a baseline understanding of rates of exchange. Uh, so somebody who is um, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, somebody who's in like uh, high school, perhaps uh, somebody who hasn't taken a calculus course, uh, might not uh, understand the uh, the sort of mechanisms behind this. Um, as for explanation of the mechanics of the model itself, um, uh, I thought that it explained well without over explaining. Um, they are a little less brief than the mathematical explanations, uh, but I think this is by necessity, because it is sort of uh, harder to understand uh, with a, uh, even with a baseline knowledge. Um, if I had any criticism of that, I would say that occasionally uh, it may have been useful to give reminders of uh, what certain elements were uh, meant by when they used the, uh, the sort of um, variable representations. Uh, so the models, uh, there's the model with no delay, the base model that goes from T to I to B. Um, and this is its main purpose in the project is just to demonstrate the concepts and patterns that the other models will uh, go off of. Uh, the model with delay, uh, right, uh, it inter uh, introduces the cells that are infected but not producing virus. It also introduces interferon. Uh, which is produced by those cells. Uh, then there is the model with treatment, which was the one that I uh, must have scrolled past earlier. Um, it introduces a treatment with a certain effectiveness applied at a certain time. Uh, it does not change the structure of the rates of exchange. Uh, it just adds these, uh, uh, it, add, it adds the, um, uh, it changes the, the rates themselves. It does not change the structure the way that uh, the model with delay adds a new 
um, uh, I forget the word, <laughs> a, a new uh, type of uh, rate being exchanged. Um, uh, and there's the model with immune response, uh, which introduces effector cells, which kill infected cells. Uh, overall, I thought it was nice. Uh, the uh, black and white uh, with color uh, is, uh, uh, is used effectively. The, um, the, where there is color, uh, I think, is a good uh, place for highlighting. Uh, the sections didn't seem unnecessarily short. Uh, uh, sections begin with bolded titles in various larger font sizes. Uh, I noticed that some of the uh, titles are smaller than other titles, and I noticed that the uh, more important titles were larger. Um, uh, and then citations are included unobtrusively, uh, but easy to find where relevant data is used. Um, the lack of a title or similar element structurally, uh, I think, made for a weak beginning. Uh, and there's a lot of white space due to the organization of the placing of graphs and mathematical models. Uh, so I thought it probably wouldn't hurt to resize some of the tables and charts. Uh, and uh, last sort of uh, various other notes, uh, there are a couple of typos, not many, but they're there. Um, uh, because so many variations of the model are covered, uh, it, it begins to feel repetitive as uh, the same uh, model elements are uh, gone through again and again. Um, and while it makes sense, uh, this is like, I'm getting into nitpick territory, but while it makes sense to have the base model to be displayed next to the uh, hand altered one, uh, it didn't seem very necessary and it compounds the white space issue. Uh, and then citations, both full and text are well placed. I was impressed by that. So I guess I mentioned it twice. And uh, I would have liked to see uh, combinations of the different kinds of models presented because while we see uh, say the the model with the um, uh, with the treatment, we do not see uh, how treatment interacts with a model uh, that has the delay, for example. And I think that's everything. Uh, maybe just uh, to demonstrate the um, uh, the compounded white space problem. Uh, we see here uh, that there's the, you have the default model and then you can, you can change things around, right? And that's, it's nice to have them compared like that, but uh, by having two of them right there, you have all of this white space that there's, there's so much white space here that in order to see all of it, I have to scroll, so. Uh, just as an aesthetic note. And I think that's everything. Other comments? I mean, one thing you didn't, so, so it winds up that getting the two graphs next to each other is non-trivial. Uh, getting it late to lay out so you have the two graphs in line. And somebody already showed one of those earlier in class. We were the one who did it. Somebody did it. Uh, but it actually takes a certain a certain amount of Python, or in this case, IPy uh, IPy widgets, to get them to lay out properly. Uh, the default layout is just on top of it to each other like that, and so probably just didn't, didn't do that. And there were there were two things we didn't really talk about much. One of which was what is it that that the what was the point of these models? What were they trying to to predict? What was the scientific point of the models? Did, did you did that come across, or was that not not obvious from the from the? Uh, you said uh, you're. Going to I, yeah. So, um, I I believe the the point with the models was to uh, was. Uh, I don't want to say they were for their own sake, uh, but they were to show uh, modeling of uh, different uh, uh, different ways of modeling uh, influenza within the law. Uh, so uh, they're sort of um, uh, their their sort of scientific point was 
was to uh, to see that model. So it sounds like they didn't convey the scientific question very effectively. If you if you came if you came away with it without being able to say you're going to learn how such and such biological process works or such and such medical process works, uh, maybe that wasn't conveyed as clearly as it could have been. Um, so I think I think that that's uh, I mean it's interesting to me that that didn't come across. And then the other thing was what what. How about in terms of what they asked did this the, 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 the exercise asked you to do? Were, yeah. did, were they? So uh, the exercises uh, mostly were asking you to uh, change the uh, change certain parameters. So like for this, uh, adjust the value of P uh, and see uh, uh, how these adjustments change. The, or up did, the, did you try any of those? Yes. Did uh, they work? Yeah. Did you find yeah. that you learned something by doing it, or was it an empty exercise? Uh, well, I think they, uh, for the most part, they demonstrated uh, things that were uh, probably already evident from uh, what was explained already. Uh, so, uh, like adjusting the, the or adjusting P, the uh, viral production by infected cells. Uh, when you have a lot of, uh, when you have more production by uh, infected cells, it uh, is fairly self-evident that there is going to be a quicker rate of infection as there is more virus uh, being produced. It's hard to write good exercises. So, but but okay. So you so you feel that in a sense the exercises weren't weren't teaching a lot beyond things that people know already. Uh, yeah, I think the um, uh, I don't think they revealed anything that uh, wasn't already uh, like I said self evident. Uh, but it did um, uh, like seeing how it uh, uh, does a a sort of physical change on the graph. Uh, I think is a, um, I think is a, is a good part of uh, having an exercise. I don't know. So I didn't really ask you to do this, but if you were grading this, I mean, of course, not as a fellow student, but if you sort of grade it, if you saw this as a piece of software on the net and you were going to give it one to five stars, what would you do? What would it get? Uh, over four, I think, uh, somewhere over four, uh, assuming that there is a, uh, uh, that the, the number of stars is not a, uh, an integer, right? Um, I think there are definitely, uh, places for improvement, but I think overall it's I mean, to me, the big concern is that if it's not clear what the science you're learning is, then then no matter how well designed the application is, it's not it's not really successful. Um, on the other hand, uh, again, I mean, I'm I'm not thinking. That's why I sort of said, if you saw it on the internet, what what rating would you give it? Because as a student project, I think it's it's impressive. They worked hard. It works well. They've got the exercises. Um, and so as a class, as a student project for a semester, I thought, I think it's a nice piece of work. Uh, but as a, comparing it to the ideal where you, where it would be something that would be used to really teach uh, a medical or, or mathematical or computational or biological concept, maybe it's not as effective as it could be. I mean, maybe I, I uh, wasn't understanding the, um, uh, the question, uh, but like, because it's it's uh it's teaching viral kinetics, right? Uh, it's it's teaching uh, the the ways that uh, these these models, you know, the, the way these models do. I can't do words good right now, um, and the way that uh, inserting uh, various factors uh, into consideration uh, change the uh, the way that. Uh, 
uh, these models, uh, the, the way that how it changes viral connect. Well, this is actually more or less the model we're going to do in class today. So that's it'll be interesting to see. If that okay. okay, great. Any other comments from people? Thank you very much, Ben. Okay, I'd like to go next. Um, I could go next. Okay, great. Colin, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm sure we'll Um, okay, so the application that I looked at was a vaccination model for COVID-19 or more specifically the uh, SARS virus. So the main points of the application, um, it was based on a paper focusing on the modeling of the SARS virus from 2003, which is obviously very similar to the COVID-19 virus that is currently ongoing. Um, the actual application involves the implementation of a vaccine which is not 100% effective. And it, had bas it basically investigates whether a vaccine such as this would be an actual good means of slowing the spread of a virus in a real world scenario. And it also looks to investigate which method of vaccine delivery would be the most successful. Um, it implements several different models which start from very basic like SI models to SVIRD models and eventually SVEIRD and revaccinated models. Um, it begins by explaining what a viral model is and basically builds upon that in complexity. Um, and it allows users to basically compare how real world parameters like vaccine success, total vaccinations, and when a vaccine should be implemented would be the most effective in stopping a real world viral infection. Um, here's a, the actual application. And so, as you can see, there's a very big biological background, which I think is one of the things that this application does very well. Um, and eventually starts with very simple, what is a compartmental model? As I said, it goes from very simple to much more complicated, which is another thing I think it does well. Uh, basically explaining the rate of change from different individuals and different groups of cells. Uh, here you just have susceptible to the rate of change all the way to infected cells. And it explains basic reproduction number R0 and how if R0 is less than or greater than one, uh, the vaccine or the viral infection will spread or not spread. Uh, it eventually introduces the vaccination model or the SVIRD and fairly briefly, but decently well explains what the parameters mean and how these rates of change can occur. And it has, of course, all of the actual formulas and parameter values down here, which I are all stemming from the paper. And one thing that I found interesting is that it many times in this application reflects back to the paper directly and compares the notes between the paper and the application itself, which I think is good. Um, it then allows you to basically investigate what parameter changing can do to a certain group of individuals, such as contact rate and how that changes the infected individual count over time. Uh, things like recovery rate, natural motility, and uh, disease mortality rate. And I think these are good introductions to how changing different parameters can affect the model overall. Uh, then looks more into the actual main point of the paper and the application itself, which is, or itself, which is the vaccination rate and efficacy of a vaccine that could be implemented. And uh, it just lets you play a little bit with the parameters of vaccines and how they could change the model overall. Um, and then it goes on to basically introduce a different model in, in its entirety because it adds the asymptomatic or E to the SVEIRD model. And it again explains the different formulas and some of the parameters. And again, has, it gives you the ability to basically change specific parameters and see how they are now affected and how they are different from the original model that was created, which again, I think is good. One of the things that I thought was a little bit too much was some of these parameter changings, which are 
kind of repetitive and are seen a lot throughout the model or the application, but they're useful for introducing uh, different models. And this is one of the examples of how to compare the results of the paper to the actual application models itself, which I think is a very good thing to at least keep the reader and user of the application um, in touch and understanding with the actual paper that this application is based off of. Um, it then introduces one of the final models, which is the SVEIRSD model, or the one that basically says that immunity or resistance is not last forever and you can go back to susceptible. And again, it lets you have or play around with the parameters and eventually goes on to the questions, which I think is one of the best parts of the model. It basically includes the exercises. This is just explaining parameter fitting and how it would impact the actual model itself and how it impacted the models seen in the paper. But the questions themselves, which are seen further down, uh, basically allow the user to answer for themselves how changing certain parameters and vaccine parameters specifically can affect the overall model in the application, which basically compares to how certain parameters in the real world could affect an overall viral infection. Uh, the first is, again, what fraction of the population needs to be vaccinated in order for the epidemic to end. And it allows you to play with vaccine efficacy and vaccine coverage rate until, as you can see, it says epidemic ongoing or epidemic ended. So I think that's a good kind of, I think it's a good uh, way for the user to understand the actual values of the parameters and how they affect the overall the overall efficacy of the viral, viral infection itself. The next question is similar, but it's saying that if there are a limited amount of vaccines, what's the optimal allocation, meaning what's like the specific timeline and how they sh the vaccine should best be implemented. And it starts basically with vaccine coverage rate and total vaccinations and vaccine efficacy until the viral infection ends. It doesn't specifically say at what point the viral infection ends on these next two questions, which I think is something they could have added. But um, it also lets you play with burst vaccines, which is to say that there are not enough vaccines to cover all the entire population in the first go around, or at least most of the population, and basically implements vaccines in bursts, which I think is really good because it's a more realistic and real world way of vaccines being implemented such as this. and a real world way for viral infections to be fought. And this one is similar in the two, to the last two questions, but just basically asks if you need to revaccinate the population after a certain amount of time, which again, with things like COVID right now is something that definitely is a possibility. Let me just play around with those a little bit. But um, overall, I think this application makes very good use of the simple to complex model buildup because users are then allowed to fully understand the more difficult modeling concepts because they have a full grasp of the earlier concepts of modeling. And it also compares the paper results to the application very well. And I thought it was a bit repetitive. As I mentioned, some of the model types have many adjustable parameters which are, have been seen before. And although they're good for introducing new model types, they're not necessarily needed for individual parameters. Uh, they had a good use of the questions and exercises to be answered, which is something I think I could definitely draw from because it allows the user basically to answer the questions themselves to relate them to the real world parameters and how they could be used to fight a real epidemic such as COVID-19 or SARS. And I think it's a good, it, could, it was a good relation to uh, the actual biological concepts involving the vaccine efficacy rate and things like that. So that was about it for that project, for that application. So it sounds like if we were going to pick one of these as a, as a sort of a case study to say, this is one you might want to look at and, and be inspired by. Sounds like you felt this was a pretty good application. Yeah, I thought overall this was good. And uh, it sounds like the, the exercises were more effective in this one than in the 
in the one that uh, Benjamin presented, perhaps. And also that the, the, the fundamental biology questions seem to come across. Okay. Anything else at the comments? That it's, uh, I think I think your point about repetition, and I think Benjamin also talked about repetition a little bit. Uh, it's not easy to. It's that's a tricky one because if <clears throat> if you don't repeat things, there's the risk that somebody misses the point. But if you do repeat them, it's uh, it's uh, it, it, the, the, the 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 examples and the exercise get very long, and. Uh, in a sense, maybe what one would like is to have. <clears throat> yeah, Delaney says your 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 internet's not working. I've been having trouble with the internet all day today too. And I don't know if it's the internet or Zoom, but I I I've been having dropouts and problems with with say the internet's unstable, and I keep checking my internet connection and it says it's all right. So. I don't know if anybody else is having issues. Okay, that's great. Um, but I think I think that that was a nice uh, a, a nice analysis of this. And I guess maybe it's worth having you sending around a link to that one. Uh, having you send a link around to people, because if you think that that's a good example that people should use as a model for their class projects. Um, we can we can have people look. Yeah. <clears throat> in the chat. Okay, so Benjamin, you're also having problems with the internet, but not just me. Great. Well, thank you very much. So, so we had Colin and Benjamin, and Drew spoke. Uh, Drew spoke two weeks ago, right? You were the you were Drew. If you were the first one, weren't you? So, so I can see. go before I get kicked out. <laughs> How do we do that? We better we better take advantage. Do it, and then we, so Delaney and Ryan, you've got your your own. Let me fetch the um, actual presentation. Should have been ready. Oh, I can Actually, Ryan can go ahead while I situate myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to start with the uh, uh, the experiment itself and uh, later move on to the presentation. Yeah, so uh, we, so basically this talks about, uh, the, the source paper is uh, the optimal radiation dose to induce robust systematic anti-tumor immunity. Uh, so they look at two different uh, treatment strategies for uh, treating cancer, which is basically radiation and immunotherapy. Uh, they start off by uh, a very brief discussion about uh, cancer. Uh, so uh, they talk about primary tumors and secondary tumors and how, I'm sorry, uh, how most of the people don't die from the primary tumor, but uh, uh, the, the fatality is of, often induced when the, the cancer metastasizes and there's uh, basically cancer cells that are breaking away from the primary tumor and uh, going elsewhere. Uh, then they talk about uh, the immune system. Uh, they talk about uh, B cells, T cells, uh, dendritic cells, and macrophages. Uh, I, I guess the main takeaway here is that uh, th there are various phases in which the immune system kicks in, and uh, 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 its, uh, its intervention with the system cannot be uh, ignored when you, like, uh, kind of study any any system, any biological system, uh, because it's non-trivial. Uh, then uh, they 
talk very briefly about uh, radiation and immunotherapy in general. Uh, radiation is basically just uh, uh, focusing energy uh, that is carried by waves uh, uh, and its purpose is to kind of disrupt the information in the DNA, which basically makes it uh, stop uh, uh, like reproducing. And in immunotherapy, uh, you basically, uh, uh, you are kind of supplementing your own immune system and uh, helping it uh, do a better job. So they start off with uh, this uh, mathematical representation of how uh, uh, the radiation response and immunotherapy uh, uh, contribute towards uh, uh, the, like our, our, our two good strategies uh, that contribute towards the potentially treating a cancer, uh, potentially treating cancer in a patient. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, one thing that I would uh, probably want to tell at this point is that uh, uh, radiation in itself is not seen as a, a permanent solution to cancer treatment. It is it is often just used to uh, kind of uh, like treat cancer, it cannot eliminate cancer, but uh, so that's exactly why they are using these two strategies. Uh, uh, like uh, they are using those two strategies together and not uh, one of them individually because uh, individually they do not really uh, stand a chance. Okay, so just uh, going towards uh, this. So this uh, uh, entire uh, uh, like this entire experiment is uh, structured in such a way that there's an increasing level of complexity. And uh, there are five levels of complexity uh, to be precise. Uh, and these are those. Uh, so first they simulate a immune system with uh, two tumors growing independently. Then they simulate the effect of radiation on primary tumor uh, without an immune response. So uh, again, the immune response is important because uh, radiation not only destroys the cancer cells, but it also has an effect on the normal cells uh, that are present in your body. So there's only so much radiation that uh, a body that any person can take. So uh, uh, at this point, they are not dealing with the immune system. Uh, at the third level of complexity, they deal with simulating immunotherapy, uh, uh, but with no radiation, which is basically the second method of treatment. And in the fourth level of complexity, they are talking about simulating radiation on primary tumor to see effect of uh, uh, on secondary tumors. Uh, so basically, the in the fourth step, what is happening is that they are uh, kind of uh, using radiation on the primary tumor, but uh, uh, they are monitoring the effect that the immune response has on the secondary tumor to kind of give you an idea about uh, how the the natural immune response kind of seem, uh, tends to complicate uh, things for us and basically gives us a time window for doing radiation. I mean, uh, you cannot go on uh, treating a person with radiation forever. And finally, we uh, uh, at the final level of complexity, we talk about those two things combined. Uh, we talk about radiation, uh, radiation and immunotherapy working together and, uh, and what the results uh, that would have. So yeah, going back to the presentation. Uh, so yeah, so this is the first level of complexity that is being introduced where, yeah, where uh, uh, they uh, let us uh, kind of tweak the rate of growth and the holding capacity of, uh, it's, it's basically called the carrying capacity of the tumor. So uh, various sites in the body have different carrying capacity uh, of, uh, uh, like of uh, the ca uh, cancer cells. So for example, uh, lungs may be able to hold a certain uh, you know, uh, degree of concentration of cancer cells uh, and that could probably uh, be different from the colon or you know, something like that. So yeah, so that's, those are the two things that they are kind of uh, playing, let us play around with uh, and it's, it's working, it's, uh, it's functional. Uh, then, yeah, then we come here where we are basically talking about, this is the second level of complexity. So they're talking about uh, the effect of radiation on primary tumor, but without an immune response. So again, here, the only thing that uh, they uh, are basically letting us do is uh, 
zoom in and zoom out uh at, and talk about like uh, the effect uh, uh over a long period of time so one thing i would like to highlight here is uh, just uh, they have like beautifully captured how uh, radiation is uh, leading to that uh, sudden decline in in the number of uh, c1 cells so c1 and c2 are basically cancer 1 and cancer 2 uh, uh which is basically the primary tumor and the secondary tumor. so yeah so that's that's the first thing that uh, they're showing but uh, if you if you notice uh, even though radiation is working in the short term it the the cancer soon goes back to its normal levels so yeah and this is the third uh, uh, level of complexity uh, where uh, okay no uh, yeah so one one great thing about this presentation is that they not only let us play around with these uh, parameters but they actually go, uh, take the pain of explaining uh, what happens when you play around with them which i found uh, like i personally found very helpful while trying to understand uh, what they're talking about uh, and uh, yeah so this is the third level of complexity where they are simulating the effect of immune system but without immunotherapy uh, e star is basically something that is called the equilibrium point uh, which is uh, the point at which the the working of the immune system kind of stabilizes uh, so you can adjust that and you can see how uh, things change again you can zoom in and zoom out and see uh, what is the effect uh, for a longer period of time uh yeah and uh, again they go forward to explain uh every single one of those cases like uh, what happens when you tweak every single one of those parameters uh yeah finally uh, they this is a fourth level of complexity they talk about simulating immunotherapy uh, but without radiation uh and yeah this is this is where it gets interesting uh, we can uh, simultaneously play around with the efficiency of uh, radiation the strength of uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, the immunotherapy drug and also we can zoom in and zoom out so uh, i think this is uh, as this is pretty much a very highly complex uh, and detailed model that they were able to uh, come up with and uh, again as you can see that uh, we have a very long period of time where uh, the cancer is almost uh, like reduced to zero and again it it comes back but uh, yeah it, this is this is proof that uh, the 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 therapy act, the, the the treatment that these people uh, were trying to simulate actually showed had an impact yeah and uh, now uh, uh yeah they talk about simulating radiation on primary tumor to see effect on secondary tumor so this is when this is uh, like what i mentioned earlier it's uh, basically trying to understand how radiation affects not only the cancer site but the body itself so uh again c1 d1 e1 i1 c2 d2 e2 uh, uh, anything with the subscript one is talking about tumor and uh, like uh, c d e is basically like uh, cancer cells uh, cells that are uh, being killed by radiation cells that are being killed by uh, immunotherapy and so on uh, yeah so that's pretty much uh, and yeah uh, then finally uh, they talk about simulating radiation on primary tumor with immunotherapy which is the highest level of complexity uh, that they get to uh, uh, again you can uh, kind of increase the period of time that you uh, no i'm sorry this is probably uh, this is the intensity uh, uh, of radiation and uh, uh, yeah and uh, again we can zoom in and zoom out uh, so yeah so basically uh, uh, it has been uh, discussed over five levels of uh, complexity and uh, the equations for each level of complexity has been uh, given uh, they finish off with uh, an appendix where they again they talk about uh, uh, the actual equations that uh, they uh, used when they were uh, coding the ode model uh, and uh, yeah so they also provide a very brief uh, explanation for the same uh now i just want to kind of
talk a little bit about what I uh, found good and bad about this paper. So uh, I think the pros were that uh, there was a comprehensive collection of OD equations. Uh, you don't have to look outside the paper. Uh, you, uh, sorry, the, the experiment, uh, everything uh, that is functional and working in this experiment is basically, it's basically self-contained. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I found the, exp uh, the explanation for parameter tweaking very helpful because, because personally that reduced the amount of time that I had to invest in uh, understanding the model. So I really appreciated them doing that. Uh, and uh, the increasing level of complexity approach basically makes things easier for uh, someone who is trying to understand uh, uh, something like this for the first time because you start at a very trivial uh, point and then gradually you increase the complexity, which I found uh, very useful. Uh, uh, and also uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight was that uh, there were like, at most there were like three parameters to tweak. So it was not an extremely complex system, even though it was representing a very, uh, uh, it was representing a highly complex model. The number of parameters that uh, were available for tweaking were less. So you could, uh, it was easier to kind of visualize that. It was easier to keep a track of that in, in the back of your mind. Uh, so uh, that is something that I would definitely take away from this project. Uh, Jargons were avoided and uh, concepts were presented in a relatively easy to understand way. Uh, the only delta that I would want to say is that there was no comparison with other types of models, other types of mathematical models or uh, computer simulated models. I would have found that very helpful if they would have probably talked about some other uh, uh, experimental models that uh, uh, basically uh, basically, I had nothing to compare this model against. Uh, I had to just take their word when they said that this is what happens. I would have uh, really loved it if uh, there was some way I could kind of validate uh, the results that uh, this model was able to obtain uh, with respect to what, what actually happens uh, in, the, in the real world uh, or with probably a different experimental model. So that is something that I found uh, uh, missing in this experiment. But other than that, I think it was uh, extremely informative, uh, very well structured, and I would give it uh, 4.5 stars out of five. Thank you. Great, thank you. That I remember that student project. The, the student, one of the things that was complicated was that the paper that the source paper was not very clear about some critical points in the model. Mm -hmm. And so there were certain things that had to somewhat in some level be guessed because the paper didn't describe itself very, very detailed. Oh. I think, I think, I think your, your presentation of, of it was very helpful. That one thing that maybe did, didn't come across and maybe I don't know whether this was was in your reading of it or was actually in the in the in the in the application. Is you you mentioned you this this concept of of primary versus secondary tumor, which is critical. The problem with radiation is that you can only irradiate the tumors you know about, because if you don't. The secondary tumors, metastatic tumors, can show up anywhere in the body. Mm -hmm. yep. And a lot of the time they're very small, so you don't see them. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, the primary tumor is larger, so you ir irradiate the primary tumor. But as you pointed out, and they, they point out, that the secondary tumors are the ones that kill you. And so, so uh, the the problem with radiation is if it, once the tumor is spread, radiation doesn't do you a lot of good. And then, then the question I think was, which maybe and again I don't know if she, if it was presented in the in the application or not, um, is this idea that when you when you irradiate a primary tumor, you kill some of the cells in the tumor. That's what radiation is for. The radiation itself when you kill those cells, excites the immune response. It causes a stronger immune response. Your immune system 
early on in a tumor is in early on in a cancer is able to keep the tumor under control. It recognizes and kills the cancer cells. And so the idea was that the radiation itself excites immune cells that go in and kill cancer cells, not only in the primary tumor, but in the secondary tumor. And if you then could amplify that effect, you might be able to get rid of the secondary tumors even without irradiating it. And so I think that, that was the purpose of the model. Oh, and uh, maybe that didn't come across as clearly as possible. I mean, maybe that wasn't conveyed clearly in the way that the application was written up. Yeah, I think the fourth level of complexity uh, that I discussed uh, was exactly like, it was exactly what you're talking about. So I uh, couldn't really understand that. Uh, but uh, again, I have to admit that I didn't really uh, spend a lot of time on it. So yeah, but uh, that, uh, now that you say it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's exactly what it was talking about. But 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 it's important that, that that idea be conveyed because if you read the first paragraph and you don't understand why you want why you have to combine radiation with something else, mm -hmm. if that idea isn't conveyed clearly at the very beginning, then people probably aren't going to read through it and do the whole thing. You know, it's if you only learn at the end that you need to supplement radiation with some other approach. Got it. Yeah. Uh, then 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 the the application isn't doing a job of teaching mm -hmm. um, or it may be doing a reasonable job of teaching for people who are committed and who are definitely going to stick around and read the whole thing but if it, it's not doing a good job of hooking in the viewer from the beginning because it's not conveying the key idea from the beginning um, and it looked just from what you were showing as if some of these that we've seen are very beautifully formatted and, and elegant. This one looked like it was a little rougher in terms of the visual presentation. That may not be the most important thing. True, that's true. Um, and your point about the lack of comparison to real world or experimental uh, to, to other simulations, I think is interesting. Although this paper was relatively path-breaking, people hadn't done much in this area. Um, the original paper, Heiko Enderling is the president of the Society of Mathematical Biology at the moment. Uh, he's at Moffitt and does a very nice cancer model and is very interested in, these days, very much interested in clinical deployments. I think when this paper was written, perhaps he was a little bit more theoretical in his approaches. But it sounds like it sounds like it's it's interesting that both of the papers, all of the all of the applications that have been presented today, uh, had some good features. I think Ben, Ben, and and Colin and Ryan, you all found that there were very there were good things about the the apps that you looked at, and they all had some weaknesses too. Uh, that's inevitable, but I think it's it's useful to to try to think seriously about what it is that uh, when you're presenting your projects, what are the things that you'd like to see? And I think I think it's hard to do that when you because you know why you're doing your project. At least presumably by the end of the semester, you know why you're doing your project. Uh, but it's not always easy to convey that to somebody else. So. Okay, other, other comments? Giuliano, TJ, do you have anything to add on any of these reviews? Your feedback would be most welcome. I think people got, the, the reviews about the, the tools were great. I think you all just got everything right. And good eye. Yeah, I'll agree. With Giuliano on that, these are these are great reviews. Um, yeah, nice job. Um, especially liked to hear um, some of the feedback that um, we often discuss when we go to write papers. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan, for example, mentioned about um, what would have been helpful in um, some of the background content concerning comparison with existing models and so on and so forth. Those are those are issues that we discuss every time we go to write a paper. Um, and so I would say that um, that's a, a good sign. I think everyone is, is in the right headspace um, in their reviews of these apps. 
I mean, I think I think Benjamin was the only one who talked more in deep, more detail about sort of the visual aspects yeah. of the tool. And and I typically would say if it, if I'm grading an application, I'm going to focus on is it clear, is it well presented, does it work, uh, do you learn something from it, rather than the visual app, the visual uh, aspect. On the other hand, if you're trying to reach out to a broad audience, the 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 layout and the and the graphics and and the visual aspects of it are quite important. And so I thought it was very nice that that, that Benjamin uh, mentioned the visual part of it, uh, because I think that that while that may not be the the most important thing in your own project. Uh, if you have time to make the, the, the application visually appealing, that definitely will help. The curb appeal definitely has an effect on how many people will use it. And I think on the clarity as well, uh, I think your comment about having the, 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 the graphs on top of each other so you couldn't see them both at the same time. Uh, whereas if they were next to each other, you could actually see them at the same time. Uh, those kinds of things are, are seem minor, but can be make a big difference to the usability and how much you learn from using the app. In Ryan's example, I noticed in some of those later uh, simulations, and also maybe uh, a little bit in the one Colin showed, um, that a couple of those more complicated simulations, they were probably using just the 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 plot. The, the 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 generic plot function, and so it's plotting all of the all of the time series for all the variables on one graph. And so there were so many lines, it was hard to know which line was which. And so maybe in those applications, having two separate plots or having only some of the lines plotted would have made it easier to follow. Uh, again, those are the kinds of things where in a short one semester project, you don't have the opportunity to keep coming back to the project and refining it, which is why I'm asking people to try to get their projects in, at least rough projects in early, so we can do that. Um, because of course, when you're writing the application yourself, the first thing you want is to have the material there and to have it run. And, and, and it's only afterwards that you, once you've got that basic material laid down, it's only after that that you have the luxury of going back and asking, how does it look? How do I present it most effectively? Um, but it was interesting to see to see the difference in, in layout and the graphical approaches in these in these uh, in these uh, applications. I noticed in one when you do the when you use the iPi widgets, uh, sometimes they 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 display this. Uh, angle bracket uh, end function to the, the angle bracket. And I remember there's a trick to get that, to suppress that, and I don't remember what it is. <laughs> Somebody figured it out last year, so we have to look at these. But one thing you could do is you could look at the source code for these, and if, they, if somebody's got a layout you like or uh, an approach to formatting you like, you can always copy that. Definitely good to plunder these things for ideas. I don't know. It looks like uh, Delaney uh, lost her internet connection. So we'll have to see. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. That was very helpful. I appreciate it. I hope it was useful to you to, to get some ideas for your projects. So, so the next thing that I wanted to do, which is also on your, on your, on your shoulders, Uh, was to have people report on how things went last week. You did a, a project on in-class replication while I was away, and I'd like to hear how it went, see what your results were. And I realize you didn't have much time to prepare, but I think uh, that discussion would be useful. Giuliano and TJ, could you lead that discussion so that uh, uh, since you were you were in charge, I, I'd like you to to uh, invite people to present and discuss and, and see what happened, okay? Yeah, thanks.
can't remember who began talking last time to give them a bit of a break to the end. So I don't know who to call first. Um, I guess you could start with Bruce since he presented two weeks ago. Yep. So he wasn't, uh... There we go, Drew. I was going to go with alphabetical, but that works. Uh... Hold on, I, I've still got a bit of setup to do. I'm actually on a different system. I got to get the files going on my current computer. Okay. So, so anybody else? I'll, well, Juliana, you, you steer. I'm, I'll get out of the way. Yeah, so let's go with alphabetical then. Benjamin, um, how far did you get with the replication last week? Yeah, uh, I, I remember uh, last week getting the farthest uh, of everyone, but I can't find, um, I might have done, uh, I might have done very bad and uh, not saved it uh, because I can't find the uh, uh, anything except the empty one. Uh, so, um, I could uh, like I could open up, I could share the empty one and then uh, go through and explain what I remember doing if you want me to. Well, maybe third time is the charm calling. Um, no, sorry, I also don't have it pulled up at the moment, and I'm trying to find it. Okay. Ryan, you're my last hope. Uh, yeah, so I, ha I have the work saved from last class. Uh, uh, I did make some progress after that, but uh, I, I think I did that in a different folder. So I could probably just start uh, the discussion off by uh like uh, helping us get to i think where we finished off in the, in last class like together yeah yeah so uh if i'm not wrong uh I think we had got we got to this point. We we had plotted these two lines on our own, uh, and uh, this so, was basically. So, so Ryan, since I wasn't there, are you willing to spend just a minute explaining what the paper was and what what the point of it was, so we can all be on the same page? Uh yeah, sure. Uh yeah. Uh yeah. So basically, I I also worked on the assignment, so I'll just pull up the assignment because that will. Give me something to refer while I'm talking. Yeah, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Perfect. So uh, essentially, uh, this paper was talking about uh, uh, the HIV virus uh, and uh, math mathematical models that help us uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 help us uh, understand uh, how the virus behaves in the uh, uh, just after the infection and uh, till the point of till basically ten years. So uh, initially, it was uh, almost. Uh, assumed in, in the scientific community that uh, till 10 years, uh, uh, the virus remains dormant and uh, does not really do much. So uh, it was assumed that even if it is, if it remains untreated or if we don't intervene in that period, uh, it's probably okay. But uh, later on, uh, uh, we move towards the direction of, we move towards a direction in which we uh, are now convinced that uh, that is absolutely not the case and uh, intervention during those first 10 years are is very crucial towards uh, uh, successfully uh, reducing uh, the number of uh, uh, virus uh, that we have. Uh, we have still not found a way in which we can eradicate it, but uh, 
we can uh, reduce it to sub, such an extent that it will be undetectable by a blood test. So, uh, yeah, so two things. Uh, so they, they again, they do, uh, they uh, have a increasing complexity approach uh, in this paper. They start off by a very uh, basic assumption. I think it's like a linear, linear model that they uh, start with. Uh, and uh, they try to assume the, like they try to calculate the rate of increase of, uh, uh, I mean, the virus uh, in that linear fashion. Then they slowly add in complexity such as, uh, uh, like how does the immune system respond to it? And uh, 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 also, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure about the levels of complexity that they add, uh, but I'll have to take a look at the paper for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially uh, uh, what it is trying to investigate is, so uh, uh, what we know is that uh, the HIV virus uh, affects the CD4 plus T cells. Uh, and uh, so one very crucial assumption in this paper is that uh, uh, the, uh, the virus is not really infecting other cells, like probably like red blood cells or white blood cells or even other, t other type of T cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, like one thing that is, uh, one thing that is confirmed, with ev confirmed by evidence is that uh, the CD4 plus T cells uh, reduce uh, drastically over a period of 10 years. I think it goes down to like some 20% or something. So, uh, so that, that is, and these cells are essentially responsible for uh, production. Like it, it's basically a very crucial component of the immune system. So without these cells, the immune system essentially breaks down. So uh, everything that is explored in this paper is focused on the virus's impact on CD4 plus cells, uh, T, uh, CD4 plus T cells. It kind of ignores everything, its impact on other cells, which is in in one sense a very reasonable assumption to make, uh, given that this is the most uh, uh, evident uh, uh, change that we can see in the system over a period of ten years. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, Again, they also assume that uh, immediately after the drug is administered, it is available throughout the system in a very uniform fashion. Like it, it, it does not take into consideration the spatial and compartmental aspects of the body. Uh, uh, it also assumes that uh, like, uh, bef uh, like before treatment, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the production of virus is zero, which basically is again, like is what, it, is what the initial assumption was that it, the virus kind of goes into a quasi steady state uh, in that uh, zero to 10 year period. So, yeah, so, yeah. And also I found like some new data that talked about a, a new model. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's essentially what I could find. Okay, good, well, that's the start. Um, I mean, I think, I think the thing that was critical there and, and you mentioned it biologically, was that there was an assumption that if, if the rate of the amount of virus was low, that the amount of virus being produced was low. And that wound up not being the case. What wound up being the case was that the amount of virus being produced was high, but the rate at which the virus was being eliminated was high. And since the, since the net viral load is dependent on the amount produced minus the amount removed. What you were seeing was the small number, which is the difference between two large numbers. And that in the end, of course, made a critical difference into the, to the, to the treatment of HIV. And it, the, as I, this, this was a paper that, that, that saved millions of lives because it, it caused people to rethink their, their approach to treatment of HIV. And I realized that for, for many of many or all of you, perhaps virology and, and these issues are, are unfamiliar. And so the biology behind a lot of these things may not be so familiar. Um, and that's okay. Uh, it takes time to, to, to familiarize yourself with these ideas and pick them up.
Um, and so it's, I think, Ryan, the way you're grappling with this was a very good introduction to the problem because uh, you, you pick the pieces that make sense and then you try to fill in around. That's great. Okay, does somebody want to pick up Gru or Benjamin or Colin? Are you ready to pick up? I guess Delaney, you're back. Did you want to do your review of the of the 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 the, the uh, of the uh, application as well while you were while you were gone? Uh, Colin and Benjamin. I guess Benjamin was you were here while Benjamin was presenting, but Colin and Ryan presented their reviews of the. Uh, of last year's app. Did you want to do that now? Before we continue with our uh, going on about last week's project. I'm still sure? having some internet issues. So is it okay if I present next week? Okay, if you like, that's, uh, that's fine. I don't want, I don't want to. I don't want to put people on the spot. Thank uh, okay. you. Okay. Okay. I, I know how frustrating it is when the internet doesn't work. So. Okay. Okay. So who, who would like to continue with the discussion of, of results from last week and what, what still needs to be done? Juliana, I'll, I'll, I'll return the, 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 the class to you and TJ for a moment. Um. I think for the, um, what was presented already is pretty good. Goes to the heart of the paper. I don't know um, who else has something to show. I think Drew, have you been able to get this? Oh, Drew is no more. Okay, so more people having internet uh, problems. Um. Don't know. Um, so how far did you all get during class? Was to the that fit to the simplest model, or did you manage to get further with the T cell population? Um, I got to fitting or uh, plotting the model with fitted parameters. Uh, Looks like uh, we just lost Juliana. Aye, aye, aye. I don't know what's going on today. Internet assassins are coming for our internet. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but uh, sorry. So let's get let's give Giuliano. TJ, do you want to say anything while we're since you were involved with the last week? Um, no, I think I think it'd be better to leave it to Giuliano. I I uh, took more of the role of technical support and uh, moral support, um, so probably it would be more valuable to. Just wait for Giuliano to come back around. Okay, let's let's give him two minutes to see whether he's able to log in again. Uh, and if not, we'll we'll if not, we'll uh, we'll go back to other things. I don't want to keep you waiting, but uh, since he's just started, let me see. I'll, I'll check. Also, excuse me. I'll just check my email to see if he sent a message about being disconnected.
Hello again. It seems that today it's the day for everybody to have internet issues. Uh, okay, where were we? Oh, here's Drew. Hi, Drew. Did you manage to download the stuff to the PC you're in? We cannot hear you. Okay. I guess the computer is telling us it needs a vacation. Yep. We've actually been pretty lucky so far. So Delaney, while you were out, while you were just... Uh, okay. Is this, is this mic loud? Is this working or not? <laughs> it's loud and it, there is some background noise, although the noise is going <laughs> down, I think. Oh, let me see if I can get my other one working. But yeah, we were just going over what you guys did and whatnot. Um, and yeah, still on that subject. Well, I was about to give Delaney an update on what she missed while while she was off, but oh, she's, she's she, yeah. she got disconnected. Yeah, today is not the. Oh dear. Uh, have people been having trouble with the internet outside of this class or is this is this um... uh, this has been my only class uh that's online, online uh today uh but yesterday uh and uh, this is really the only class that I uh, attend on the school Wi-Fi just because uh, the time between my uh, last class ending and this class is such that it would be impractical. I'd probably have to break uh, the speed limit to get home. So, you know, uh, I try to stay within legal parameters. Uh, so this is the only one that I really do on school Wi-Fi. Uh, but I was having Zoom issues yesterday as well. So uh, it might just be a, uh, a sort of calamitous piling on of stuff. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I know because most of the time the internet's worked fairly well for us. Okay, there's Giuliano again. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna say I'm lost track of where we were. We were we were still just I mean, Ryan had presented, and then you were yep. going to talk about the, where people were. I would say I would actually say that that even if we had been meeting in person. I probably wouldn't be able to be in person today because when I was traveling, people, I think TJ has already heard this story, but when I was traveling to come back to the United States, you have to have a, a negative COVID test. Mm -hmm. And the place I was staying in Ireland was not such a small town, but they did not have a testing center there. And in principle, you could do it at the airport. It says that they do tests 24-7. Uh, but in fact, 24-7 does not include Sunday evening. So, so uh, uh, where I was staying, I know a, a local doctor uh, who was very kind, and he drove me to a testing center on Saturday morning. 
about 45 minutes away and I got my test done, came back, I got a negative test, everything's fine. Yesterday morning, he, he, he texted me and said, oops, uh, I came down with COVID today. So you're, you've been exposed when I drove you to get tested. So, so now I should be quarantining. So in fact, uh, I, I, I really should, even, even if we had been meeting in person, I shouldn't be doing it today. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be isolating for the next, at least for the next five, five days to make sure that I don't. My guess is I'm not, not going to get it or because I am triple vaccinated, but, but uh, it's not impossible. But there is this sort of irony, which which everyone found rather amusing, that that it would be ironic that if if I got COVID, getting a COVID test. Yes. That, yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't know if, uh, if that. If, so 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 that with that, I was trying to give you a little bit of cover time to to pull your thoughts together, Juliana. I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, uh, so yeah, the next part of the paper was to add the model of T cells in their population and see how, what, what the steady level was there. And finally, to add the infection of T cells. So think. Not sure how far people got since I left class a bit early last week, but yeah. So Drew, how far did you get? Uh, Benjamin's right in his assessment of your microphone. Um, okay. Uh, I am yeah, opening it right now. Unfortunately, I can't remember what I called it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I was just a bit behind everyone else last week, but I was disconnected. What did we already talk about uh, in the model? Well, Ryan introduced the paper and what it was about, what it um, talked and what the paper was about and what assumptions it made. And he got as far as fitting the um, decrease in viral load post treatment. So if you got to, but he didn't stuff. show any results, really. Oh, true. So if yes. you have simulation results to show or simulation code to show, that would be fine. Uh, I don't think of the right thing. Okay, I think I have it here. I'll share my screen. All right. Uh, so yeah, it looks like I got as far as the fitting here. And yeah, I, I put the first and second 
fit results here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just reopening this. <laughs> it's all new to me again. Okay. So did you fit on regular space or did you fit on log space? So yeah, whenever I fit log space, uh, I, I was fitting log space before, but it didn't look correct. Uh, so this is this is linear. Okay, so where are the data you're fitting to? Yeah. Uh, here's where I load in the data. Mm -hmm. so usually you want to put your data on your, and your fit on the same plot. So you can yeah, see probably should do that. that. <laughs> uh, scanner. I can try that. I mean, I don't. It's not wrong to put them separately, but it makes it a little harder to see whether things make sense. Yeah. Let's see what it looks like. Everything. So you, by the way, you've got the, you've got the nice layout function in, in in Matplotlib here, which is something that your 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 colleagues in the class probably should be copying because that's precisely the code you need to do the displays that that people that that I think uh, uh, that uh, Benjamin was saying were. Remember, Benjamin, you were saying that you wanted to have the plots next to each other instead of on top, of, above each other. So the the the, uh, the figure the figure layout here is precisely the code you need to do that. Well, there we go. Uh, and again, the fit is only for the days after the treatment. That doesn't look doesn't look obviously like a good fit, but of course it, it may be that, that that you can't do a good fit. Maybe the the exponential decay or the linear decay doesn't doesn't match the data very well. Yeah, and it's just a linear. Uh, can you scroll up to where you are doing the fit? There, I think I do it here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not a good fit because you are doing it in non-log space. So if you are doing it like this, you shouldn't try to fit a polynomial of first degree. You have to actually try to fit the exponential. Right. And that would make sense why it didn't look right when I had it in log space down here. Yeah, but if you instead do... Um, the poly one and two. If you do, oh, also in here you have to select. Well, there are, there are two things. First, you are fitting to data one in the two fits. So the poly one and the poly two are fitting to the same data. Um, uh -huh. Two, you need to select only the days greater than zero. Right. Are greater or equal. And you, I, you need to, yeah, you need the same location on the second one as well, right? I'm going to do that for, yeah. this is, let's, if I should just set this to a new data frame or. Yeah, uh, let me pull up how I did it. 
So I what I, I can just put days after this. Yeah, I'm not sure how that syntax works, but what I did was I created another array uh, indices to fit or whatever. Oh, I for some reason changed that. All right, that looks like it's at least different for these two now. Mm -hmm. That looks a little better. I mean, if you're forcing a linear fit on that data set, that's probably not too far from what, what we got. But I think you're trying to fit an exponential rather than linear. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is you put the values of the HIV, HIV RNA inside the log. So you do numpy.log of data one location, data one days, HIV one. Presumably, you have to do that before you do the fit. Yep. Okay. Oh, so I'm I'm putting data one days. Uh, the actual um, measured amount of viral RNA in the plasma or whatever so what I did what was a bit different logic but it was something like that probably don't need the numpy array just the numpy log of data one HIV so you can do it inside of the polyfit function Oh, I see. Yeah, there. Yep. All right, and this should be warped or something. I'm pretty sure I have to set this to Y scale or something? Yeah, Y scale should be log, but now you want to. So now your fit is in log space, so you need to put it back into regular space for the plot. So when you do. Yeah, the actual plot X. Yeah, then you do e to the power of y, whatever. So you use x? Do what? Yeah, so there you do a uh, numpy exponential of y. You go here? Yep. X. Uh, just X. X. Okay. Oh. Yep. There we go. Yeah, because uh, it, it's a back and forth, right, between log space and real space. You you 
turning the data into log space, you get the function in log space, but then when you want to plot it, you want to get the function back into real space. It's, right. yeah, it's easy to, to lose track. Yeah, I think the first time I just skipped the whole log thing and just removed that, but this looks a lot closer. Yep. And it's very similar to that one. Yeah, those two plots. Yeah. I think that's as far as I got. Yep. Yeah, so the next step would be to me. So this is the same file that I gave you, but without the things removed. So one trick that I did for the fit was I'm not that used with actually using pandas data frames. I like them, but I'm not super familiar. So I put the time and the measurements into regular uh, NumPy arrays just because it's it's what I I know how to to work with. Um, and then for the measurement, I put it inside of a log. And then for the fit, I use this function NumPy where, which you give it a condition with an array and it's gonna return the indexes that satisfy that condition. So I'm pretty much doing, yeah. So here I'm, I'm only using the points of T that satisf satisfy this condition and the points of Y that satisfy the same condition for the fit. And uh, yeah, so this, that fit and same idea for the second one. And here I'm just plotting everything together. Uh, yeah, so here I'm both plotting the fitted function and the fitted model. And we can see that the fitted function and model are exactly the same. Uh, and then what I did was just for fun, kind of, was to see how long it took the patients to get to the steady state, assuming that the model was 100% right. So I loaded up the model, I loaded up the um, parameters that we fitted, set the viral load to zero, and they got to the steady state in under 40, 40 days using this very simple model. Okay, so here, yeah. So here I was just an exercise of adding events. So after 50 days, the patient gets the treatment and it perfectly shuts off viral production. And then I replot with the actual experimental data. And here, what I had to do it was to offset the experimental data by 50 on the days, because that's how long, well, that's the time of the treatment event. And still looks pretty okay. And then we go into the T cell population, which, uh, at least in 1999, the population dynamics of CD4 plus T cells in humans is not well understood. I think that's still the case, which is kind of, I don't know, disappointing. I mean, it's been a while. And yeah, so here I'm just implementing the T cell population function, setting the population to zero and takes 200 days, it seems to get to the steady state. And also notice that even though the maximum population is 1500, it only ever gets to just below 
a thousand. Um, and here I did, I just set the population to be double T max just to see the decay and how that looked and looks the same for both. Um, yeah, so here I show why it's a thousand because this is the steady state. If we were to plug in the numbers, I'm pretty sure they would give a thousand, give or take. And now we actually add the infection of T cells. So we actually need to differ differentiate infected and uninfected T cells, writing this new equation for infected and replacing the viral production by, um, which was a constant by this. So the T cell infected population, N is the average number of virions this T cell produces before dying. And delta is the mean time for T cell death after infection. And in the paper, they argue why this works, but it's not too hard to see. Yeah, so now this is the model with everything, some placeholder numbers, and we see how things go. And I set 10% of the T cell population to be infected at the start. And there is no virus, I think, here. Yeah, no virus. But we see that everything gets infected with at, at least these placeholders. And then we will go into finding the extra parameters that were introduced by using the steady state and some actual tables from the paper. And this is uh, supposed to be your final exercise. And I'm going to be honest that this one, I got something wrong. And I still haven't found exactly what, but yeah. So I have a question on that one, the previous, the one that the one you just showed above. This? Uh, that one. Yeah. So what is the, how are you creating T cells? Where do the, you're, you're creating infected T cells, but are all the infected T cells originally uninfected T cells? So, so, okay. So the T cells are produced with the logistic equation. Yeah. Yeah. There is a natural production from organs, thymus, and stuff, and then right. reproduction. Oh, let's see. So nothing goes to T. Right, that is, so it goes to zero when T is equal to T max. Zero when you have no T cells, okay. And the death rate of the T cells is goes like the square of the population. Is that correct? Uh, oh, no, DT is DT is uh, is, a is the rate. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so and then they become infected and they die. I don't understand how you can have a continually increasing number of infected cells. I would think that what if you start, what if you have no infected cells to begin with? Can you turn the, turn the virus off? Yep. Uh, Just make that zero. Yep. Um, but I think I already have the answer, which is this is kept constant. Everything, get, all T's get immediately turned into T by the infection. Right, but t but this should saturate. This should give you S over DT as your as your number of, as your equilibrium number of T cells. Why don't you run that and see what it does? Oh. 
I'm sorry for everybody, but everybody worked on this together. Okay, so the num maximum number of P-cells you get is 1,000. Yep. So now turn on the T-infected again. How can you have more T infected than you would have had T cells? Because T infected doesn't come into this. Regularly, and the argument they make in the paper to not have plus T inf here is that T inf is the number of infected cells is 10 to the minus four or minus five, the number of uninfected cells. Yeah, but that's not what you get. If you take the TN out again. Yep. Okay. So, so you, what you're saying is you keep, you keep. Okay. So that the infected T cells don't affect the population. So you keep producing more T cells. Yeah. And they get instantly turned into infected. Right. And, and, and then it depends on, and then it depends on the. That's great. So basically you never saturate, but you should still, you should still wind up with the T being, what's S over D delta T? S is, S is 10, delta T is 0 0.02. So two is 100, two is um, So it should still be, it should still saturate. Yeah, two thousand. Can you run it to a longer time and see what happens? Yep. Hmm. Still goes. No, it can't it can't diverge like that. So something is not doing what you think. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where the issue is, but there's something that. No, oh, where, okay, so, oh, because the death rate of, so the death rate of the T cell, the death rate of the adult infected T cells is very slow. Is that right? Uh, well, placeholder. Right, but make that bigger and then let's see. Yep. Let's move this. Okay, so now you wind up with no infected T cells. Yep. And no, infect, no uninfected T cells either. Okay. So add a zero and so on. This is the actual number. Well, I don't know whether it's fair to code in front of everybody. Just, yeah. but I, I, I'd like to get a sense of how much people are able to do and where they are, because this is a, in a sense that these in-class coding exercises like this are, are trying to help you understand the papers you're working on. And, uh, it takes, it's, it's not easy to grapple with a paper like that. And so trying to understand what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, how to make it work. These are not trivial things. So I don't know, Giuliano, how you'd like to go forward with this. Um, 
I'm not sure. So yeah, you're muted, James. It sounds like people didn't have much chance to work on it after after class last time. Yep. So I don't know what how you want how you want to go forward. With. Yeah, um, I know if I also don't know what you had planned for today's class. So, I don't well, know. I was going to go back and do this very simple. I mean, what I had planned was much simpler. I was going to do just a basic SIR type infection model that we started on uh, two weeks ago that was uh, that was uh, um, that was uh, we didn't finish. Now it's of course, much simpler than the thing you're doing now, but maybe it's worth going back and doing it. Yeah, I think uh, it is. And so, especially yeah, because we have two people who are not here. Yep. And so working on this project together probably is not. Yep. Yeah, go back into a, a shallower area of the pool for a bit. Right. So, so let me just spend an hour going back over some of the material that we we had done before. And uh, I will repeat some of the things we did two weeks ago because we rushed through them. And so this was building a very, very simple model of influenza infection. And it's also a Perlsonian model. Uh, Alan's work shows up everywhere. And we started out by last time looking at uh, the pattern of viral load. Um, depending on, on the disease, you might monitor different things. You might monitor the amount of virus in the nasal passages. You might monitor, uh, if you were talking about cancer, you might monitor the size of the tumor. Uh, you might monitor the number of C the number of CD8 plus T cells. And, and the particular data series that you're looking at will influence to some extent the kind of model that you're going to build. But uh, in this case, we were talking about uh, situations in which we measured the viral load versus time. And uh, in Smith's uh, paper, review of this, she points out that there are patterns of viral infection that are typical. Um, the one for HIV is pretty complicated. Uh, actually, the one for SARS-CoV-2 seems to be pretty complicated too. Um, but she identifies a couple of patterns, one of which is the viral load goes up and then comes down again. And I should say that here she's just showing sketches and she hasn't labeled the x-axis, which is time, linear, and the y-axis, which is viral load. Uh, but the pictures she's drawing are assuming that the y-axis is on a log scale. So actually, the changes in viral load are even bigger than, than they might look, because there should be a log on the y-scale. And she identifies four typical patterns of viral infection, although there are many more than that. Uh, one of which is the viral load goes up, it reaches a maximum, and then it goes down pretty fast. Because remember, a straight line going down is actually exponential decay. The second one, which was typical for influenza, is that the viral load goes up very fast. And there's a period when it goes down slowly. And then that's followed by a period when it goes down fast. And then there are more complicated situations in which the viral load comes up, goes down fast, gets stuck. And in the biphasic decay, it gets stuck and the virus never goes away. And your HIV example would be probably pretty close to that biphasic one. Um, and another one in which it gets stuck for a while, and then eventually the immune system comes in and clears it out, which is the triphase. And uh, she draws a sketch of the uh, uninfected cells, the T cell, the, the target cells, 
which reproduce, they rep replace dead cells um, and which can die. Those target cells can be infected by circulating virus. Uh, in this case, there's an I1 phase, an early infected cells phase followed by an eclipse uh, or eclipse phase followed by uh, virus producing cells, virus releasing cells, I2 phase. Those cells die at some rate. And of course, the virus that's released uh, can go on to infect other cells. And the virus is also cleared uh, in the environment. And so that, that's actually the model we'd like to write down. And the key things uh, param parametrically in that model are the rate of death of the infected cells, of the I2 cells. And the immune response, if there is going to be one, would be represented in that D of I2 function. Uh, for comparison, those are just sketches, but for comparison, uh, I had the uh, experimental curves from an early study of SARS-CoV-2. This is now not in live animals or in humans, but in vitro, in, in, in cells growing in a dish. Uh, in that situation, there is no cellular immune response. Uh, there can be an interferon-induced antiviral resistance. So it's not that there is no immune risk reaction, reaction, but there's no cellular immune reaction. Mm -hmm. And they helpfully in that uh, study measured both the amount of virus inside the cells proper and the amount of virus in the fluid above the cells. And that gives you a measure of essentially how long it takes uh, for the cells to go from beginning to produce virus to releasing them. That gives you a measure of this eclipse time or eclipse rate, one over K. And what they found was the solid lines are the amount of virus inside the cells. The dashed lines are the amount of virus above the cells. And you'll notice that it always takes longer. The dashed line is to the right of the solid line. That means that it takes time for the uh, virus to be released. And there are a couple of things that are perhaps a little bit worrying about these experimental data sets. Um, the first one is that they have two different kinds of cells. They have VRO cells, V-E-R-O cells, and they have uh, HUH uh, 7.0 cells. And these are two uh, cells that are uh, transformed uh, cells. Um, neither one of them is a lung cell. Um, one of them is a kidney cell, if I remember right. I don't remember what the other one is. I'll have to look it up. Um, and we can see two things, that the black cells, these Vero cells, are able to produce a lot of virus. The viral load goes up quite high. And we see a latency of about six hours between the time the virus gets turned on initially and the time it's released. Uh, we also see a rather complex pattern of uh, viral production, you see this rapid increase uh, between six and 12 hours of virus. And then a longer period goes on for 36 or 40 hours where there's a slower increase of virus. And then you see a little bit of a decay towards the end. Decay towards the end may well be because most of the cells in the dish are dying. With the green cells, we see the same turn on inside the cells, but the cells don't start releasing virus at all up till 30 hours. So in one case, the latency, that I1 di2 latency, the eclipse duration was six hours. In the other case, it's 30 hours. And so that gives you something to worry about because it means that depending on what tissue you're in, 
you may have very different latent phases. The second thing you see is that the amount of virus produced goes up uh, over the period of 12 hours, and then it saturates. And it doesn't change very much for the following 70, uh, 65 hours. Uh, and the total and the maximum amount of virus produced is much lower for these HUH cells than it is for the Vero cells. And so the time scale over which things happen is different. And the maximum amount of virus produced is different and the shape of the curve is different. And that means that you're in trouble if you want to do experiments in a dish, which is a lot easier than in a live animal, and certainly a lot easier than doing in a live human. Uh, because the results you're going to get will depend very sensitively on what kinds of cells you chose. And you don't have access to the cells that you're particularly interested in. You don't have cultures of the particular human lung cells or throat cells or nasal cells that you need. And so there are all sorts of issues in terms of how you interpret these in vitro experiments, uh, which are, are significant. Okay, and the next thing we did, and I'll do it again because I think it's important, was we now looked at uh, Amber's published data sets on viral infection now for influenza in mice. <clears throat> and so what she did was she took mice, she blew influenza into their lungs. They actually don't get influenza very easily. You know, it takes effort to get them to be infected. And then once a day, approximately, she measured the amount of virus in their lungs. And one thing we saw and talked about last time was that measuring once a day doesn't give you the temporal resolution you really would like. You'd like to be able to measure every six hours or at least every 12 hours. The problem is that making that measurement is tough. It's expensive and difficult to measure. Uh, and that means that um, typically you don't get it. The other thing that we saw was around day eight, there was a huge scatter in the measured viral load. And the reason for that is during the period between day seven and day eight, the amount of virus goes down by a factor of 10 to the fourth, so 10,000. And that means that if your times are off by even a little bit, you'll get a very different result. If things are changing 10,000 fold over one day, being off by six hours is a tenfold error. And so uh, there's a temporal uncertainty that means that the values of day, day eight are quite uncertain. And how you fit that is not obvious. The other thing that is, is difficult is this region, she's labeled region three, which is where the maximal viral load happens. And you'll notice that there's no sampling at the time when the maximum should happen. And so that makes it difficult to know when the maximum happens and what the value of the maximum is. And again, I'm not trying to be critical of the experiment. The experiment was a very elegant experiment. Uh, but it does suggest the, the, the difficulties you face when you're trying to do fitting because of the limited experimental data that are available. Okay. Um, now, she then makes a set of biological hypotheses about what these different regimes mean. There's an initial lag phase when the virus is uh, infected cells, the initial bolus of viruses infected cells or inoculum of viruses infected cells, but the cells are not yet producing virus. That means they're all I1, they're no I2 cells. Then there's this rapid exponential growth is, uh, for zone two. Um, when those I2 cells, well, I1 cells become I2 cells and start producing a lot of virus releasing the environment. Then uh, zone three is essentially when you get the highest viral load. Zone four is associated, she believes, with the innate immune system. 
uh, interferon-induced antiviral resistance, and also macrophages, and neutrophils, and natural killer cells, which are cells that go after viruses generically or infected cells generically, not are not targeted specifically to the infecting virus. And then the zone five, when the virus gets eliminated, uh, which is associated with the appearance of um, adaptive immune cells, uh, antibodies, targeted antibodies, uh, and CD8 plus T cells. So we went through this and I'll go over it again because it is so important to be able to do this when you look at these data sets. Um, once you've seen the fact that there are these regimes, you need to be able to quantify what those regimes are. Some of them will have to more or less guess at because of the limited data sets. But the first thing is that the virus does not start being produced instantly. There's a little bit of a delay. And if you look at the position of this line crossing the, axis, the zero axis, it happens at about six hours. So we're gonna guess that the eclipse phase of this virus is about six hours. And I'm cheating a bit because I actually know that that's about right for influenza. And that we're always gonna to have to, wait, we're gonna to have to convert uh, times to, to, to rates. So eclipse phase of six hours is a quarter of a day. So the rate of conversion from I1 to I2 is about four per day. Then we have this critical leading edge, which is this exponential growth. Again, there's quite a bit of scatter in the measurement. Remember, this is a log plot, so scatter here is huge. It means there's a hundredfold uncertainty in the value. Uh, but if we pick the median value of about four, we've gone from zero to four, that's a factor of 10,000 increase, over about a day. Maybe a day minus six hours maybe a day plus six hours, but about a day. And if we want to express that in tenfold units, our value increases by a factor of 10, four times in a day, or 10 or by 10 over a period of a quarter of a day. Um, here I've actually got a little bit more. So here's, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm talking and, and not looking at my own slide. Um, I've lo I was looking at this 10 to the fourth here. Um, her point actually is that that 10 to the fourth is a little bit early. Um, and she'd say that the day peaks here at this maximum in zone three. Uh, and for her, her, that's 10 to the sixth. So she'd say it goes up by a factor of 10 to the sixth in, in a day which means that it goes, the, the amount of virus goes up tenfold over four hours. I was saying that it goes up tenfold over six hours. That doesn't sound like a big difference, but when you have exponential growth, the result is huge because the amount of virus you get will differ by a factor of 100. <clears throat> the maximum viral load in the units which are these log 10 TCID 50, as we talked about last time, is about 10 to the sixth. And then we have a period of approximately five days when the amount of virus is going down. It goes down fairly slowly, but it does go down by a factor of 10 over six days. And so we can then, and then in the tail, if we look in the in zone five, we really only have one, two data points to describe that decay. Uh, and it doesn't fit a straight line very well because these points here uh, at day eight are actually higher than that. But we have approximately a 10 to the fifth decay over two days. 
And so we can then convert everything into units of uh, tenfold per how much time. In this case, it's tenfold over two fifths of a day uh, in the decay, the fast decay. The slow decay is tenfold over five days. That is, um, let's see, five divided by 10. So 25 divided by two is 12 and a half times faster in the tail. Um, and the exponential growth was tenfold over a sixth of a day at the beginning. And so those are going to be the rate constants we're going to need when we begin to build the model. Okay, so what we want to do is build a model of uh, the replication and elimination of the virus. Uh, you've seen this model repeatedly now because it's in the Perlson example, it's in some of the examples that people showed uh, from last semester. Um, and what we need to do then again is identify what we're going to describe, what are the variables in the model, what are the objects of the model, and how to characterize them. Uh, we'll build the model step by step, trying to fit that time series, um, and then try to estimate the parameters. And so we could look at the viral life cycle in more detail. The actual viral life cycle is pretty complicated. Uh, the virus has to get into the cell, it has to be unpacked, its genome has to be copied. Uh, some of the genome has to be cut in pieces and used to build proteins. Uh, the viral genomes that have been copied in the proteins have to assemble to make new virions. Those virions have to be then released by the cell. So there are quite a few steps. And the very first thing we're going to do was going back to the very first thing we did in class, the very first day of class, which is to have a model of the infection of uh, susceptible cells. And we're going to say that the probability any individual susceptible cell becomes infected is just proportional to the amount of virus that we have times uh, infection rate beta uh, times, of course, then the rate's going to be then total rate's going to be proportional to the number of cells that can be infected. T. Now, since in reality, the virus is used up, once a virion goes into a cell, it can't be used again. Uh, we really should have something that looks like a reaction, T plus V goes to I1. Uh, but in fact, um, the amount of virus is so much bigger than the amount of virus used up in infection that we can more or less ignore that. The other thing is that uh, Perlsonians tend to be a little bit sloppy about this, um, that the cells are being infected individually. And so we shouldn't be writing a rate for the whole ensemble of cells because that rate will change as we change the number of cells, where the rate shouldn't change. The rate's an intensive variable. And so we have to rewrite this uh, rate law here uh, to make it an intensive variable. Uh, in that case, we have beta times the number of cells infectable times T times the amount of virus per cell. And that gives you then an intensive quantity that makes sense. Now. If we use this very simple model, we have a fixed amount of virus and the number of infectable cells decays exponentially at a rate beta of V times time. So why don't we do that as an in-class exercise um, so that we'll do something together. Uh, this, I will remind you, is exactly what we started with in the very first lecture. So you might have it sitting around. If not, uh, it should only take a few minutes. So why don't people do that? Write a basic infection model. Uh, T goes to I1 at a rate beta T times V. Assume that your initial number of uh, 
susceptible cells is 10 to the seventh. Assume you start out with 10,000 10, virions. Uh, and for that, it winds up that the beta is 6.2, 10 to the minus five uh, for this equation. So why doesn't everybody try, try doing that? Fire up, uh, fire up uh, tellurium and see what you get. Does somebody want to show their results? Anybody? I mean, again, it's not a very exciting result, but somebody was willing to screen share and just show what they got. That would be helpful. Colin, do you have it? Drew? Uh, yeah, I can share mine. Okay. Here we go. Okay, sure. All right. Not 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 the most exciting result in the world, but uh, uh, okay, that looks fine. Did other people get something similar? Okay, good. So let's do our next step. So that was that was what the model looks like. And you get that, which we saw. And so the next step was to have uh, early infected cells become late infected cells. And so we're going to add a single line. Uh, I1 goes to I2 at a rate K times I1. And we said that the eclipse period for influenza was about six hours. For SARS-CoV-2, it's about 12 hours. And remember that the, the period is the reciprocal of the rate. So if we were going to write I1 goes to I2 for influenza, it would be about uh, one uh, was about six hours, which is about uh, four per day. It's about a quarter of a day. So K would be four if we were doing influenza. For uh, SARS-CoV-2, that it's about 12 hours. That is a half a day. So that would mean it would be about two. So K would be two for SARS-CoV-2, would be about four for influenza. Uh, we'll use the value four for the moment. So why don't you now add a single line uh, to your equations, uh, saying you have now an I2, I1 goes to I2 uh, at a rate uh, K, where K was equal to four. All right, everybody try that. Does somebody want to show that? Well, well, the last person is working on it. Ben, do you want it? Do you have it? Yep. Okay. Okay, that looks fine. So why don't we try changing K from four to two and see what, what the difference is. Notice that it, the, the peak is higher. Um, and the, uh, 
and the duration of the I1 phase is a little bit longer. If we look at the I2s, if we look at the I2s, I'm not sure that we see very much difference. It might be worth looking at. So one thing maybe to do would be in that first plot, use show equals false. So you can put them on the same graph. Didn't. I did not plot that. Huh. Does M not M dot plot not allow the show equals false? Oh, it did. That's just right. That's just it's all right. We can leave them out. It's There you go. Okay. So there you can see it doesn't make a huge difference the number of I twos, but it's, a, it's legit. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's let's keep going. We don't have that much time, so let's keep keep moving ahead. We're not doing anything very sophisticated, but it's uh, it's good to do that. Okay, so that was example there. And uh, the two examples we saw just now. So now we have to think about the production of the virus. Uh, we started out with the virus being, uh, being a constant amount. And now, since we're trying to actually predict the the amount of virus and make that agree with the experiment. Uh, this is the critical result. Um, we're going to assume that the amount of virus produced by the cell, each cell is a constant amount per unit time while the cell is alive. And that's almost certainly wrong uh, the cells start out producing a small amount of virus and they produce a lot for a while and then they start ramping it down because they get sick and they eventually die. But we'll assume that overall each infected cell produces P amount of virus and that P is measured in the strange unit of TCID. It would be much nicer if we could measure it in terms of the number of viral particles. Uh, rather than in the call and then then in the infective potential of the virus, but that's the standard way we'll do it. And so the next thing we'll do is we'll say that the amount of virus uh, is uh, linear in I two, so dv dt is equal to pi two. And it's important again to remember that the thing we're really trying to replicate is the viral load curve, so we need to know that. All right, and so now we'll add nothing goes to virus at a rate P times I2. Uh, and we'll see what happens. So now virus, amount of virus, instead of being something that we pose from the outside is something that's um, created um, by, the, by the cells themselves. So let's do that. Um, so we'll put in now uh, the uh, and I'm sorry, this slide got messed up. I, I apologize. Um, this slide should be uh, 
should be the rate of vial production, which should be here. Uh, <clears throat> we add the equation P I2 goes to V. So nothing goes to V at a rate P times I2. And we'll assume that the rate of production is one TCID per cell per day, which is ridiculously high, but it'll work for the moment. So why don't you try that? Again, we're adding exactly one line to our code. And now in principle, we should have something that we can actually compare to the experiment because we have the beginning of this uh, viral load curve. All right, does somebody want to show that? Screen share that. I can show mine. Great, thank you. This one okay, that, that looks fine. We don't have any mechanism for getting rid of the virus. It doesn't have a lifetime in the environment. So once we create it, it sticks around. So that looks fine. And the one thing we might want to do because of the, uh, the way those plots are done is to put the uh, y-axis on a log scale. Oh, and the one, problem, the one problem we'll face when we do that is that some of the values go to zero. And so when you plot it on a log scale, you have to cut off the value at, at, uh, at, at, at some finite amount. Usually we use one. Uh, so log, the log, the log, Log of one is zero, so we we'll use one. So um, for m dot plot, I think it's, I don't remember whether it's y axis or y scale. I have to look it up. Uh, somebody can help out, take a look. I don't have that in my top menu. Yeah, I believe it's the Y scale, but I'm not sure what input. Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, it's log y equals true. Log y equals true. All right, and then you have to then you have to restrict the vertical scale, which is so we have to do that, and let them be. Uh, the format for that is not scale, but limb, which is not the most convenient thing. So it would be this. That should be Y limb, not X limb. Since we're doing it. Oh, do you have it on your screen? Should I stop sharing? I put it in the chat. Oh. Oh, it's it's y limb equals square bracket one comma ten 
e to the eighth. Yeah, there you go. All right. So 10 is still, so one is still probably too small. So you could make it 10 to the fourth or something. The lower axis, the lower one. And the fourth. No, no, other way. Oh. Make this what? I'd say 10 e to the three or 10 e to the four. You just want to make something arranged that makes that shows you what you've got. There you go. That's not bad. So now let's look at the viral load. The viral load starts out near zero. It starts out small. There's a teeny delay at the beginning, and then it goes up exponentially for a while, and then it saturates. Now we could ask, how does that compare to their target picture? Our target picture, which was not fantastic, which is the answer is not fantastic, uh, but it's not totally wrong. If I plot it, um, if I plot it here, here I plotted the viral load versus time uh, on a, uh, on a semi-log scale. Um, I'm trying to compare here. There's a little bit of a delay and actually the delay is right. It's about a quarter of a day. Um, and then there's this increase and let's see how much it increases. It goes from 10 to the one at, for a quarter of a day to 10 to the sixth after one and a quarter days. So it goes up by a factor of 10 to the fifth over a day, um, which is not too far from what we saw here. Here we had, um, during the exponential growth, we had 10 to the ten to the sixth over a day. Uh, so it's not too far off. Is that is that clear? Because this is this is sort of the, the basic set of ideas that we're doing here, which is walking through adding one step at a time to our model and comparing step by step what's happening temporally in the experiment is a critical aspect of how you do model building and validation. So if it's not clear, please do ask. So what we've got now is something that has a delay and then has exponential growth. And there's also the saturation we see after a day and a half doesn't correspond to anything we see in the experiment. All right. So now let's try just in this region, uh, changing, I, I'm asking you to do parameter sweeps, but since we are gonna run out of time, let's not just, let's not do a parameter sweep, but let's just try changing uh, a uh, and see what we got. Um, we could change the infectivity, the eclipse phase rate, or the uh, uh, viral release amount uh, and see what's going on. So maybe we should go back to your screen share and, and let's do that together. Fine. Yeah, that's fine, whatever. Since you were showing it before, so so now we could try. Um, maybe it's easier if we just plot um, if we just plot the uh, the viral load curve. So so well to begin with, let's 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 play a little bit more. So let's use your reset all that you've got here, which is nice. Um, why don't we copy the, the, the plot function so that it, it does the, the whole thing so they're consistent. So 
So now you've got the same thing twice. Let's do your true false so that we can put them on top of well, but it's gonna be it may be too much to see it once if we put them on top of each other. So let's just leave it this. Let's change, let's change one of the key parameters and see what happens. Let's make that, let's make that uh, eclipse phase longer. So that would mean m dot k uh, were equals equal to um, one half, say. That would be a four, a two-day eclipse. Let's see what that does. Oh, make it one half. Yeah. So what do you see? If you look at your green curve, you can see that it's slowed down a little bit, right? It, it takes longer for the green curve, which is the virus to take off. Um, look, at, look at the number of I1 cells. They're very different, aren't they? Notice the number of I1 cells stays high for much longer. And the rate at which you get your I2 cells is slowed down a lot too. And the rate at which all of your T cells become infected is slower. It takes now a day for it to happen, whereas in the other one, it happened after half a day. So that has a pretty dramatic effect. The latency that the eclipse time has a pretty dramatic effect. Uh, let's try, instead of changing that, why don't we change beta? Um, and one way you could do it is just say m dot beta equals m dot beta times 0 0.5, for example. That slow, so we've now used a lower beta means the infectivity of the virus is lower. Um, so you'd expect there to be a little bit less infection. And it's subtle, but if we look carefully, you see that the total amount of virus is less and it takes longer, a little bit longer, not a lot, but a little bit longer for the things to happen. All right. And what other parameters do we have to play with? Not so many. Um, we've looked at K, uh, we've looked at beta. The only other one we can really play with is the amount of virus each cell produces. So why don't we double that? So we'd say m dot p, m dot p is equal to m dot p times two, for example. Be a higher amount of virus produced. The faster the virus produced, the, it speeds things up a little bit. You notice the blue curve comes down a little bit faster. Um, it's hard to see that the, the viral load is a little bit higher. All right, so that, that gives us the view of what's going on. All right, any questions about that so far? So let's uh, think about how you get rid of virus because the virus doesn't stick around forever. In this model, the amount of virus just keeps going up. Uh, in fact, um, there are biologically a lot of things that get rid of virus. First, the virus itself is not completely stable. If it were, we'd be in big trouble because you couldn't avoid it. Um, within the body, um, your blood has molecules that break virus down in a variety of ways. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details. Uh, there's a component called complement uh, that binds to the virus and inactivates it. Um, there are also mac or neutrophils that come around and eat the virus, um, get it rid of it. Antibodies cause the virus to bind together and become inactive, although we're assuming mm. 
this is what's called a primary infection where there are no antibodies. But the net result that we're going to assume in our model is that there is some lifetime of the virus. When the virus is produced, it doesn't stick around forever. It just decays. And so we'll add one arrow to our plot, which is that the virus goes to nothing at a rate C times the virus. And the lifetime of a uh, typical lifetime for a virus in your lungs, for example, is an hour or two. Uh, if we assume that the amount of virus is on the order of two hours, uh, then the clearance rate, we have to turn two hours into days. Two hours is a tenth of a day, a little more than a tenth of a day. Um, and so that means that the clearance rate is about ninefold or tenfold per day. So why don't you try that? Um, let's add virus goes to nothing, clearance of the virus, uh, and the rate of clearance being a 9.4 per day. So why don't people add that? And let's see what we get. If you look at almost any paper on, on in-house file replication, we'll use this model. This is the standard base model. So is it clear what you need to do? You need to just add a single line, V goes to nothing, semicolon C times V, and C is set to be 9.4. Does anybody have it? Okay, so again, we're adding one line, V goes to nothing, a rate C times V. I have to define the value of C, which I said was Does anybody want to show what they got for that? I can show mine. Okay, thank you. Here's mine. I also do a parameter sweep if I want. Try that. Yeah. Up. <laughs> oh, it probably doesn't like the five because you it's um let's see. Probably because you've got try putting fifteen point zero in. I see. There we go. No, yeah. I should probably change the time frame too. 
Yeah. So so it doesn't have any if it has almost no effect on I1. Uh, almost no effect on I2. It does change the amount of virus produced. So which which parameter were you scanning? Uh, C. The lifetime of the virus. So that didn't seem to make a big effect, did it? So let's let's just to, 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 to improve your pictures a little bit. Um, let's let's to begin with. Let's just plot. Let's just plot the virus. Um, so it'll, I think it'll be easier to see it if you plot the virus. Try that. Can do this. Okay. Okay, that's great. And your and uh, let's put it on a log scale too, because because the. Uh, So you could just say y, y scale equals quote log quote quote. There's also that y log one. Okay, there we go. That's good. So that doesn't make a huge difference, does it? I'm actually a little bit surprised. Um, it doesn't do a little bit more than that, but when I but when I did it myself, I I got the same thing, which is that it flattens out the production of the virus, uh, and so that maybe gives us the three, gives us the maximum value of the virus, but doesn't give us the decay that we see, and so. To get that decay, and I guess we're going to run out of time. So why don't why don't people try to get this set up? So for for next week, uh, why don't people try to get this little demo cleaned up? I like what you just showed very much, where you had the parameter scan. That was nice. So maybe you could send your code around to people, and people could put their heads together. And what we'll do next week. When we start over, starting in again, um, maybe people can have worked a little bit more on their on the uh, paper replication. But again, in a sense, that paper was something that assumed you'd done the thing we're doing now. So I hope that as we do this, it becomes clear. Um, we've now got the eclipse phase described. And we know that if we change the uh, k constant here, we can change the duration of the eclipse phase. We've got the exponential growth phase, this number two phase described. And we know that that is controlled primarily by p, the rate of viral production. Uh, and beta, the infectivity of the virus. And now we've got the saturation of the virus, this three phase, and that three phase is controlled by C, the rate at which the virus decays. And so we have three regimes, and we can adjust those three parameters to be able to match those regimes. The next thing that we'll do is introduce the decay of the virus due to the um, due to the uh, innate immune system, and we'll be able to match four, and then matching five is more work because understanding what's going on with the adaptive immune system is a little bit difficult. Uh, but I hope we can we can come to that. And I, I'm sorry we didn't get through the whole set of exercises today, um, but uh, I think it was important to do the presentations that people did. I really appreciate the good presentations. Uh, I know 
looking at those examples and working on them was was took time. And I hope that was useful to you for preparing for your own project. I would like to meet with people one on one about class projects. Uh, make sure everybody's on on target with that. Are there any questions before we break for tonight? No. Okay, well, thank you then. I'll see you uh, in class. Or again, if you email me, I'm around now. I'm back. And so I'm available to meet with people individually to talk about this. So thank you for sticking it out. Appreciate people who did screen shares. And I will see you soon. <laughs>